Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks everyone for joining us on our first virtual State of Uptown. Um, I'm Martin Sorge. I'm Executive Director of Uptown United and Business Partners, the Chamber for Uptown. Um, I'm gonna just do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, everyone, this is a webinar, so um, just the panelists that are on screen here um, will be talking today, but we do have the Q&A feature open um, when we get to the panel discussion, so feel free to use that to ask questions. We already have a bunch of pre-prepared questions um, for Congresswoman Schakowsky and the aldermen that were gathered from our boards of directors um, and from attendees who submitted questions when they registered. So we have a lot of prepared questions, but we'll hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end um, and throughout the event. Um, please excuse us if we have any technical difficulties. So I say as a neighborhood organization, we're used to being in person all the time. So this virtual gathering is new to us. Um, but we really appreciate all of you joining. We have a really great crowd here of uh, folks in the neighborhood um, uh, from myself and all of our staff. We really wish we could be with you in person. We miss seeing all of you in person. So um, good to be with you virtually here. Um, before I get started, I really want to thank all of our staff on the team. So John, Greg, Justin, Heather, Hawk, and Jan, just for all their work they do here at Uptown United and Business Partners, the Chamber for Uptown. Um, really appreciate, especially Greg's help getting this event put together and running smoothly. And then a big thank you uh, to the boards of directors of Uptown United, Business Partners, and our commissioners of the Uptown Special Service Area for all the work you do. Um, if we were in person, we would have them stand and wave, but uh, we're not. So just want to give a big shout out to all of them for all the volunteer work they do. Um, and then I'd like to thank all of the aldermen and Congresswoman Schakowsky for joining us today. A special thanks to the Congresswoman and her office for being a big help to all of our team and all of our businesses in the community um, during this really challenging time. Um, they've been great at giving some of these federal resources and information to us. Um, so with that, I would like to pass it off to Jackie Lowy, who is the chair of Uptown United's Board of Directors. Thank you, Martin, and uh, thank all of you for, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us uh, this afternoon and, uh, and being uh, Uptown champions. Uh, we do not have uh, bios of all the folks that, uh, I'm not going to read bios of all the folks that have joined us here. Uh, most of them do not need any introduction. We're especially pleased to have uh, Representative Schakowsky joining us today. Um, and, uh, and of course, our esteemed um, group of um, aldermen who care greatly for Uptown as well. Uh, before we uh, get right to our experts here to talk and share with us what uh, plans are for Uptown, I, I do want to take a, a quick moment and um, uh, have some folks say some words about Sue Ellen Long. Uh, she has uh, passed recently and we didn't want the State of Uptown event to go forward without taking a moment to uh, recognize a true long-term Uptown champion in uh, Sue Ellen Long. Once we do have an opportunity to gather in person, we will have a very big celebration of her life and all she's done for Uptown. But in the meantime, we didn't want this occasion to go by without having a moment to reflect on uh, Sue Ellen's contributions. I can only imagine what she would be thinking of uh, this challenge here and just figuring out ways to uh, dig in heels and make, uh, make Uptown uh, continue to be great. So with that, I'm gonna start with um, Alderman Osterman to say a few words and then hand it off to um, Ed Stelton. So, um, Alderman Osterman, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing some thoughts about Sue Ellen Long. Jackie, thank you. I, I just did a chuckle because I, I, I'm thinking of Sue Ellen looking down on this saying, Uptown was just surging on a lot of different levels and uh, we were hit with the, the coronavirus, which has had just a really negative impact uh, across our city, our state, our country. Um, but um, all of us remember Sue Ellen as just and a wonderful visionary, a, a leader that brought people together. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about her since she passed and before that with the coronavirus and just where we are as a, as a community. And there was a time in Uptown's history when, in the 70s, when things didn't look like they did today. And 
Sue Ellen and Chip and many, many others um, bound together, met with people, talked to people, brought people along, got people to invest, got people to stay, supported chambers of commerce, the mutual aid associations who help our immigrants and refugees, and really had a vision for what our community could be, which is an incredibly diverse, wonderful community on the north side of Chicago. And I think that with the challenge we're facing, I think we have to think of Sue Ellen's legacy and her memory and um, think of the brighter days ahead when we're together in person, whether it's at Lawrence and Broadway or on Argyle Street. Um, and I think she'll be an example for all of us, but she left an unbelievable legacy in our community. And we're, we're very happy to have her with us and our thoughts are with her family and Chip. Thank you. Ed, would you mind uh, saying a few words? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, Ed Stellan, Executive Director of Heartland Alliance Health. And um, I actually had written a little something that seems to have gone missing from my desktop. So <laughs> I'm going to speak from the heart, which is probably the best way to go anyway. Uh, so, you know, Alderman, your words are exactly aligned with my understanding of Sue Ellen's impact on Uptown. And I wanted to share a little bit about her impact on me personally and also our organization at Heartland Alliance. A lot of people might not know, but for a big period of time, um, Sue Ellen was uh, a board member for Heartland Alliance and um, did double duty as a couple of times as uh, the board chair. So. Sue Ellen was very much an architect of who we are, an architect of our identity. And when you look at Heartland Alliance, what is our mission? It's equity and opportunity for all people. We believe that a just world is a better world. Well, that, that's the same vision that Sue Ellen had for Uptown. Um, and that's a, that same vision of you know, bringing all of us together so that we uh, can all prosper together um, at the same time. And because we're coming together, that was Sue Ellen. And certainly that was the impact that she had on Heartland Alliance. And that's the impact she's had on me too. I've worked at Heartland for more than half my life. So I've known her for many, many I knew her for many, many, many years. And um, I, I choose to honor her uh, by continuing to really fight that good fight for equity, opportunity, inclusion, and prosperity for all. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Well said. Uh, I do remember uh, when Sue Ellen approached me about trying to fill her shoes, which of course was impossible, but I said I would, uh, because of her mentorship to me um, as a businesswoman and uh, as a, a community member, um, said I would take it on and um, think of her every day when I'm uh, conducting uh, business for, for Uptown. So great, 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 great person, great woman. Uh, miss her dearly. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, as I said, oh, great. We'll, we'll also have an honorary street named after her. Yes, thank what you, Alderman Kaplan. It'll be uh, on Lawrence. She loved Lawrence Avenue, but it will be just west of Broadway, right by the Green Mill, which she wanted. Perfect, perfect location for that. And we will all be out, I know. Um, okay, with that, and in the interest of time, I'd like to uh, move to uh, Representative Schakowsky and again, welcome her. And uh, we're so glad to have you with us today and uh, get to hear directly from you. Uh, you're uh, fighting the good fight um, in Washington, DC. My uh, first question for you is, um, as you are well aware, small businesses are the the life of our communities. Can you give us a quick update on what Congress is working on uh, to continue to support local businesses through the pandemic? Um, well, first of all, let me say this computer has been going in and out. If someone can't hear me, put fingers in your ears so I can try and we'll adjust that. So thank you, thank you for um, having me here. I'm proud to be with the Alderman and happy uh, so much to be with uh, the Uptown leadership. Um, and so billi billions, you know, when I, when I left the state legislature, I learned to talk in Washington in terms of billions and not millions. And now we're starting to talk in trillions. Um, and the last bill we just passed in the house was another $3 trillion bill. Uh, uh, appropriation. So, um, but we have to get it passed. 
We've also focused um, a lot on, on small businesses, although I have to say the rollouts haven't been as smooth as we would have liked it. There have been hundreds of billions of dollars in, uh, in, in programs like the, um, uh, I, I call it EID, that's the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. Right now, the um, Small Business Administration is dealing, trying to process about um, five, over five million of, uh, of those. So, you know, it, all of these things are taking a while. The PPP, the um, Paycheck Protection Program, had a terrible first rollout. And I would say that because so many businesses were unable, I'm talking about the businesses you're dealing with. Um, the neighborhood um, uh, stores and, and, and businesses and mom and pop shops, et cetera, that never really got in the line. In fact, my bank, which is the Devon Bank, a number of small banks never got in line um, it, along with uh, the, the really big banks. And much of that money, um, I'm sorry to say, went to um, businesses who had concierge service from their banks to help them do it. We did better in the next round, over $300 billion, and I hope um, that some of you, maybe all of you who have applied, have now seen that that money is going to, uh, is, coming, is coming through to help you pay for some of the overhead and then also pay your employees to keep them um, on your on your payroll so that you're be, you'll be ready when we actually do completely open up with employees who are ready to to go to to work um, and and so that those were really some of the I think that the major programs that we have but I know that we're not done the other thing is if if you are still struggling to get through um, Andrew Gotchkowski, who is my staff on these matters, on the uh, liaison to the business community, is uh, on the call today. And um, if you don't um, have, you, you need help, we also will provide individual help if you just call our office. Um, so, you know, I think there was an acknowledgement that small businesses are the life of our communities. Um, and follow through was not as good as it should have been. And hopefully we're gonna be making um, improvements. You will have extra time to hire, uh, to, to keep those employees hired. So that's important. Um, we, we changed the, uh, the, the deadlines in the, in the bill. And you know we'd love to hear from you too on how this has all worked for you. Thank you. Uh, so good to hear that um, Uptown's in your thoughts as you continue to look at this. I, I personally, as a, a woman-owned uh, small business, uh, benefited from the Paycheck Protection Program after going through the uh, process, which was uh, challenging in and of itself, but, but ultimately did appreciate, um, relatively speaking, how quickly those uh, dollars did, did get out to, to those of us who were fortunate enough to to get them, so thank you for the, the efforts I'm so there. happy to hear that, Jackie, okay, great. Yeah, okay. yeah, so thank you for that. Um, beyond support for uh, local businesses, we know that our state and local governments will need uh, continued financial assistance from Congress. Um, how is this crisis going to impact our state and local government, continue to affect it? And um, what are your thoughts on how Congress can get um, funding to uh, state and local um, state businesses and uh, and local government and, and state government. Well, you know, um, Democrats um, passed this last bill, the Heroes Act. We did it on our own. Um, that is, it, there was uh, one Republican who who voted with us. Having said that, though, I think the most passable part of the legislation that we just um, passed out of the House. Uh, in a bipartisan way will be the state and local funding because I guarantee you that all of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle are hearing from their governors and hearing from their municipalities. 
and there is uh, significant money, $500 billion to go to state and, and, uh, and local, half a trillion dollars. Um, so let me just tell you that the um, state of Illinois um, will get about 18, over the next two years, these are two, this is two years of funding, um, about $18 billion. This will significantly uh, address the um, challenges that the state has met and the local governments, um, uh, about $350 billion. Um, for the city of Chicago, we're looking at over $5 billion over the um, next two years. Um, that should, should help significantly. Now, within that money, we expect that some of that will go to education. Some of it will go to infrastructure. So I would recommend that you start getting in line for some of the things that the that Uptown needs um, that could come from both the city and the um, state funds that are going to that are going to be coming available. I think you know there'll be a, a a scramble for how is that money going to be distributed. Now, as I said, the bill hasn't passed yet. But I think that on, in terms of the funding for state and local governments, it's going to be very, very Im important. I think some of that money um, you know, can definitely go to service um, organizations and um, helping people who are really in, in need. Um, and, and so um, it, it'll be um, spent in lots of diverse ways and probably um, will you know, our, our local governments also will be listening to constituents throughout the um, city and throughout the um, state and how they want the money to be spent. So make sure you're thinking about what a reasonable list, wish list might be for Uptown. All right, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to shift to a couple of questions that came in from our uh, participants. Uh, this one uh, is, would you support legislation to create a federal pandemic risk reinsurance program? I think, yes, I would. Um, but I, I, whoever asked the question, I would really appreciate getting um, an outline of exactly what you mean and how that would be helpful. But I think that so many structures were just not in place. Um, we um, saw a lack of preparedness in pretty much every way. Um, and we are still seeing the federal government um, washing its hands of many of the responsibilities that we think should have been that, that should be every single day on their, on their mind. Um, there's no central, I, you know, I've been focusing on, uh, on nursing homes quite a bit um, and the state and the um, local governments and the nursing homes themselves are really adrift and because the federal government has not come through with anything having to do with the supply chains. So I think a reinsurance plan makes um, a lot of, of good sense, but um, you know, not having heard that mentioned before, I'd really like to get the vision of the questioner um, to be um, translated to me um, so that I could be an advocate for that kind of idea. Um, right, we'll make sure you know, that we get connected. Okay, okay that's great. Uh, one more question, and then we'll move on to um, uh, some of the aldermen here. Uh, this is from a resident. I am a DACA, D-A-C-A, -A, recipient who works at uh, the Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago as an administrative assistant. Uh, currently, DACA's future is being decided in the Supreme Court. Uh, would like to get your thoughts on uh, where that uh, whole issue is headed so you know the um again the house of representatives long, long time ago passed hr6 which would um 
clear the status for um, DACA recipients, um, people who have been there in this country for most of their lives and are contributing so mightily as you are, I'm saying to the questioner, um, and what a loss it would be. Um, the President of the United States, um, of course, is um, anti-immigrant in every way, makes, um, you know, here, here we are, a country of immigrants. That's just a fact. Um, and, and so um, I'm having a, com a conference call this afternoon with ICIRR, the uh, immigration organization, and we're going to be talking about things, including DACA. I would support uh, once again, a clean DACA bill. Um, but we have to solve this in part in the next election because we cannot have a president of the United States on so many fronts who's on the wrong page, but um, the way he has treated um, immigrants, not understanding the essential um, role of um, immigrants. I'm first generation myself in this, uh, in this country. Um, and um, the absolute treasure um, added to the treasure of our country by immigrants. So, um, you know, that, let me just say one good thing. Um, you will see that people who um, do pay federal taxes but aren't, have an ITIN number but aren't necessarily citizens of the uh, United States um, will get the next distribution of the $1,200 checks. They will be eligible um, for that, which is important. And the other thing is um, when businesses get the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, and get to participate and get the money, there will be no examination of the immigration status of the workers in that business. Um, so there will be a number of um, people who may be undocumented, um, non-citizens, um, who will benefit from that program through their employer. Um, but, you know, still, the, um, we, we need to have comprehensive immigration reform. I think we will have it when we um, get a new administration. So voting is very important for those who can. And by the way, census is very important for citizens and non-citizens because the amount of money who will come, that will come to our communities is dependent on population. And those citizenship forms are kept secret for decades. There are stiff, jail penalties for people who would dare to expose any of that data that comes from the, the census. So we um, hope to get everyone, um, citizen, non-citizen, um, part, part of the census. I know you were talking about, uh, and, and of all the programs that are probably the most popular among, um, in a bipartisan way, I, eventually, um, is DACA because you know I know that you this is your country this is your country and I'll be fighting side by side with uh, you know like Senator Durbin who started the, um, the this effort to make sure that DACA recipients are um, here in this country so thank you thank you uh, all right I'm going to pose some uh... Other uh, questions here going forward to the aldermen. Um, I'm going to, in the interest of enabling us to not talk over each other, uh, address these questions to uh, individuals. But if you, as uh, one of our panelists, would like to weigh in on the uh, question after the uh, original person does so, just raise your hand and I'll call on you to 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 add additional information. And Jackie, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off now. But you know that um, we my my staff Andrew Gutchkowski is on the phone, and we will respond to anything that comes up. Okay. Great. Thank you again for call. thank you again for your um, for the funding for support. Chicago. What? Thank you for the funding for Chicago. You need yeah. it. I know. Thanks. It's great. Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. Thank you so but much. Now we got to get the bill passed, Terry, so help us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right.
So um, I'm going to address this question. It could go to anyone, but I'm going to uh, start with Alderman Martin. Um, health and safety of our community is a top priority, and then certainly no more uh, have we seen that than this time that we are, find ourselves in now. And certainly local businesses are uh, understand that. Um, however, the crisis has hit our local businesses, particularly restaurants, non-essential retail, personal business service, uh, personal service businesses like gyms and salons, especially hard. Uh, we just launched a survey of our 250 members and the preliminary results uh, from about uh, a quarter of our member businesses reported 265 layoffs. What's local government doing or planning to do to uh, keep our neighborhood economy going and what financial support or relief can the city offer, knowing the challenges the city's having, uh, offer for small businesses? Thanks for that great question and thanks very much for uh, inviting me to participate. Um, some of it will depend on us continuing to understand the scope of the challenge and we'll continue marshalling as much as we can in terms of city resources. The Small Business Resiliency Fund, I think being a good example, $100 million to start there. Um, we announced a more modest grant fund of $5 million that um, was distributed in uh, $5,000 um, packages to smaller businesses um, that had four or fewer employees, if memory serves. Um, we've obviously uh, deferred the collection of certain taxes um, around uh, amusement, restaurants, bottle taxes, uh, but a lot of it will continue to depend on what sort of assistance we get from the federal government because I know that housing will be a question subsequently, but um, when it concerns the CARES Act or supplemental stimulus funds, that's really going to help us determine how much money we can continue allocating towards this. Um, issues beyond that, I think where our older romantic offices can be really helpful is continuing to provide like one-on-one -on -one opportunities to talk with business owners, other representatives from businesses, as well as employees to ensure that they are aware of all the programming that's available. Uh, offices like ours have found um, <laughs> groups like yours tremendously helpful in, uh, in spreading that word. Um, I think the work that you and so many other chambers are doing is incredibly important. And so we want to make sure that we can continue to solicit input from you all and collaborate to share the message um, around what we can continue to support. Uh, a final good example being as we work through different phases of the economic recovery, making sure that we're talking with organizations, businesses, and so that there's clarity when we shift from one phase to another and a good example being um, maybe towards the end of the month allowing folks to dine in at restaurants if there's outdoor space lots of questions that we've been getting over the last 24 hours around uh, what that's going to look like so we want to make sure that whether it's may 29th or some other time that uh, it's as turnkey ready as possible and that's going to depend on just continued dialogue okay thank you uh, alderman kappelman um Uptown's Asian-owned businesses have been especially hard hit uh, even prior to the stay-at-home uh, order. Are there any programs to support Chicago's Asian business community? Um, I would encourage uh, the Asian community, but any, actually any any uh, one who has lots of concerns about their own businesses uh, to get in contact with the uh, Business Affair Consumer Protection Small Business uh, resource navigator. Um, ours happens to be the Anderson Chamber of Commerce and they serve, uh, they provide individualized counseling and support to business owners uh, and these local organizations work with individual businesses to see what they qualify for and to work with them on applications. Um, we get inundated with information uh, and it's, and I imagine businesses as well and it they, they need someone who's, who's going to help lead them down that path, who will hold their hand and help them with this, because it's a very scary time. So I, I would first start with that. Um, my office has uh, developed a, a nonprofit uh, resource listserv uh, to communicate funding opportunities, both governmental assistance and private philanthropy. Um, 
and Uptown United receives a lot of those emails and they pass it on to their members as well. But you need to join the chamber <laughs> so you can get this information. Thank you. Uh, I have to say uh, up, the Uptown Chamber has been very encouraged by the uh, local businesses who have seen the value of uh, being involved with the chamber. And we've um, just in the last month had six new businesses uh, actually sign up for membership. So uh, really appreciate the support from the business and uh, community at large and uh, hope that that continues as we all work together to get through this. Uh, let's see, let's move to uh, Alderman uh, Osterman. Uh, with the state of the economy, we expect Chicago's homelessness crisis to worsen, plus fewer resources to support organizations and government's efforts to help those in need. More people living on the street is also a public health concern. What's the city working on uh, to tackle homelessness in these difficult times? Uh, appreciate the question and glad to be here with all of you. And I uh, really want to thank Uptown um, United for all that they do. Um, they've been great partners before the crisis and during the crisis and, and moving forward. Related to homelessness, I think it, I'll say this, it's part of a bigger problem, which is going to be the housing industry. I think that um, as the chairman of the Housing and Real Estate Committee, um, along with my colleagues, Andre Vasquez, Matt Martin, and Alderman Kaplan, and many others, we're looking at the short-term protections for uh, tenants and renters, um, homeowners, and what we can do to kind of help stabilize the housing market as we see it right now to keep people safe. Um, you know, for the summer, uh, where people know that they have the, the, the sanctity and the safety of their home and not have to worry about, about being on the street. So that's th things that we're working on kind of immediately. I think the issue of homelessness is one where um, looking outward of this challenge with, with, with the economy and, and the people's ability to pay, there's the potential that there will be an increase in homelessness. I think one thing that the city has done short term is they have made more space available for shelters. Um, an example is that the Broadway Armory is now a temporary shelter. Um, because the current shelters that we have that serve homeless individuals in our community, because of the um, social distancing aspects, they're not able to be confined in, 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 a, in a shelter like they had been previously. So they need more space. Um, I think what this is going to do for the city is that we are going to have to really focus and prioritize funding where we have not in the past to really have shelters be in every community and really kind of prepare for the health and safety of homeless residents now and in the future. And I think that's going to be more funding and more locations and more supports for the organizations that help those that are homeless. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Kappelman, I know you have uh, worked tirelessly to uh, deal with the homeless uh, situation, especially as it relates to uh, the quote-unquote tent cities occurring under the viaducts under Lakeshore Drive, uh, kind of just personally heartbreaking to see uh, so much of the great work that was done. I feel like it's kind of been undone. Um, with, uh, and thank you for all the work that you had done previously on this issue. Would like to get your thoughts on um, this uh, challenge going forward. Well, I COVID-19 uncovered uh, a lot of issues that were there a long, long time ago, uh, especially for people experiencing chronic homelessness. And those, those are the individuals living under the viaduct. What we're finding is they're basically in three categories. They are returning citizens from the Illinois Department of Corrections or Cook County Jail. Uh, they are people who've been evicted from homeless shelters and nursing homes due to their behavior, often related to a mental health crisis or an active addiction. And they were also people aging out of the foster care system. And what they all have in common is that generally most of them grew up in poverty. Uh, many of them were uh, with poorly treated mental illness and untreated addictions. 
and many of them with unresolved past trauma. Um, these categories of people experiencing chronic homelessness actually represent a very small percentage of the homeless population, but they get a disproportionate amount of the resources. Uh, these are individuals who have been burned many times and remain very reluctant and hesitant to accept any social services. Those people under the viaduct, they have all been offered shelter. Uh, we even offered a, a shelter where if they were addicted to drugs, they could continue using that. They could bring their partners, they could bring their animals, they could bring their possessions. And they still wanted to stay in that environment. Um, as a society, we have reacted to their behavior rather than addressing the cause of their behavior. And that's been the issue all along. A, a huge win uh, for me, and actually Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky helped me with this, is really pushing the, the city and the Department of Family Support Services to uh, fund, uh, to adopt a results-oriented approach to rewarding community development block grants to programs that produce outcomes of actually getting people housed. Um, a person living on the streets, we, uh, taxpayers spend between $30,000 to $50,000 per year on that one person alone. And if we got them housed, um, we would spend less than half of that amount if we got them housed with wraparound services. So uh, we have to set the stage up for those three vulnerable categories that um, we can't have them keep cycling to the system where they're homeless, experiencing homelessness for 15, 20 years. That's a failed model. It's that housing first model with wraparound services that's crucial. And, and um, Alderman Osterman said it well, we have to address the housing piece. Our problem right now with the housing is the average cost to build one affordable unit of affordable housing is $350,000 per unit. And we can build luxury market rate housing for less than half that cost. So we have to bring down the cost. We've redone the building codes to help do that, um, but, but we have to do more. Uh, and, and there's some good ideas about re, uh, uh, housing that can help bring down that cost. And, uh, and we now have an ordinance that, uh, going through housing. Thank you, Alderman Osterman, uh, addressing accessory dwelling units. Just that alone, addressing that, is gonna make a huge dent in our need for housing for this population. Great, thank you. Uh, and I do wanna get into the um, housing dwelling uh, ordinance in a minute here, but um, switching gears a little bit, uh, Alderman Vasquez, um, we've heard a lot from businesses that require people to gather. And in fact, uh, normally this particular event enables us to uh, show some love to an uptown uh, business normally where we spend a lot of money at their uh, location and gather. Uh, what rule or regulations that uh, might be in place um, or will be in place for restaurants, gyms, and theaters as they reopen uh, what can we expect? And um, <clears throat> also kind of a part B to that is uh, as we all have warmer weather this weekend and look, look at uh, Memorial Day weekend, um, what, uh, what are your thoughts on how we can move forward safely and in a healthy way? Sure. Thank you, Jackie. And thank you for Uptime United for convening this and, and having us here. Um, I think it's a very challenging thing to look at because we've never been in a situation like this. And so when we think about what supporting our different businesses means, in a lot of instances, it's re-envisioning the business model, right? We're in a situation where a lot of retail locations, a lot of restaurants effectively have been stopped. Some of the ones that aren't essential, but even the ones that are open because they can't have people dining in, it's cutting into profit margins they would have it's having effects on the fact that they have to pay rent in their leases. So, so in order for us to make sure that we are able to sustain that, we have to look at things differently. And some of the things that have been discussed is, is really what it looks like to have more curbside pickup from some businesses or really trying to close down and pedestrianize certain streets to allow for more social distancing. Uh, so that's, that's something that I know um, a few of us here have been in discussion about uh, places like Andersonville and I can see it in Uptown as well. 
I think the concern that we have to have is the one you stated as well. You know, I think Memorial Day, we're going to see what it looks like this weekend with a stay at home order in place as far as if neighbors are going to adhere to it or if understandably so that pressure and anxiety people feel from being at home and isolated so often kind of bursts into let's go out. And so if, if that's going to be example, an example of, of are we ready to reopen in a, in a manner that isn't going to cause more public health concerns? But regardless of that, we do have to figure out what are new ways for these businesses to, to work? What are ways that we as government can amplify and support those businesses so people find out about what they're doing and how they're changing their model? Um, but ultimately, it is, it is a challenge. And it's something that I'm glad that there are members of the council that are, that are working through this and members of the administration. Um, I think the one thing that I'm grounded in and, and a lot of us here have been is whatever those solutions are, we want to make sure we bring it to the chambers, the neighbors and the community as stakeholders to really get everyone's input because we may have our own perspectives on how some of the businesses work, but we're really best informed when we're in communication with all the owners and what they're trying to do to make things move forward. Thank you. Um, we'd like to address a question to um, Alderman Osterman from one of our participants. Uh, can we please specifically address resources for immigrant owned businesses? Uh, gentrification is affecting our neighborhood and this pandemic will rapidly accelerate the gentrification of our area as immigrant families and businesses are, are struggling to stay in this area. And I know uh, personally from having worked directly with Alderman Osterman on creative ideas like the, um, the night market, uh, that this has always been a kind of a front of mind issue for yours, so would, uh, of yours, so would like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, first, I, I hope that the, this crisis doesn't um, add to gentrification within our community. I think uh, the, 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 the best part about Uptown is its diversity, always has been. And when you are walking down Argyle Street or Lawrence uh, or Wilson, um, you know you're in Uptown because it's, it's diverse people from every background. And um, now and in the past and in the future, there's a, uh, a comfort in everyone being from different backgrounds. And I think that's something that all of us care deeply about. So I want to make sure that Uptown stays Uptown. Um, regarding specific um, immigrant businesses, I think, um, you know, at the city level, we can look at ways to focus on that. I think we're trying to make sure that funding is, is, is put out in an equitable way. And I think um, those that represent the north side want to make sure that the diverse businesses in our community uh, are able to take access and, and reach some of those businesses. I think, to me, there's a longer term issue, and that is that um, once people begin to feel comfortable coming out safely, and once businesses have adjusted to the new rules and regulations, it's really going to be on us, and we had begun doing this with uh, the Uptown United with the night market, is making Uptown a destination for people to come. And I think that um, the best thing we're able to do is to really highlight the diverse businesses that we have and make it a destination point for people to come here and have dinner. And I think the entertainment component is critical, and I think as we get the Again, the guidelines, um, looking to have our, our entertainment venues open and how that synchronizes with the many diverse businesses that we have. But me specifically with Argyle, I wanna make sure that Argyle remains uh, an Asian American destination point. Um, and I think there's ways that we'll be able to do that where um, the diversity that has been there will not um, uh, change. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Kappelman, I know um, you need to uh, leave us at one o'clock, so I have one uh, question for you from a uh, participant. Uh, my company operates apartments in the community. Our residents are voicing tremendous concern regarding street crime in the Wilson Avenue corridor. Mm -hmm. How can the community get more police walking the street in our neighborhood? This is the single greatest concern of uptown residents of all ages. Uh, well, I, I'll first start off and say that this, the perception is there. Uh, violent crime is down to the lowest it's ever been in uptown, ever. Um, 
but one crime is one crime too many. And uh, I, I will go back on the experiences we've had addressing crime before and what worked before is going to work with COVID now. And uh, I remember June 28th, 2013, uh, my husband and some other people were doing positive loitering and they witnessed five people get gunned down at the, at the um, mall uh, at uh, Lawrence and Sheridan, the strip mall. And I, that was the day I formulated a task force working with CPD, the uh, Cook County State's Attorney's Office, uh, the local businesses, the chamber, uh, court advocacy. And we created some interventions to address the problems of gangs and drugs that were going hand in hand right in that area. Uh, within 20% of all 911 calls in the entire 20th district occurred in that one block. Within eight months of that, of those, of this targeted set of interventions that we did as a group of people, um, crime uh, went down to one half of 1% uh, were all the 911 calls from that particular block. So it dropped dramatically. And what we learned is something that we can take uh, uh, here to what's happening now. And that is, if, if, if we had this false belief that it's only the police or only the police and the aldermen uh, working on crime, we're going to be frustrated. It, it just doesn't work that way. We know what really works is having all of us work together um, with the CAPS office, the businesses, are not for profits, all of us working together. And, and that's what we're doing now. Now, COVID has uncovered some things right now because we're emptying out the jails. And you know what? We should have, we should be emptying out those jails. Uh, there's way too many people there. The problem that we have is these people that are committing some of these crimes, they have had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of arrests. And, Again, we're, we're not addressing the cause of the problem. These are people that when they are released from Cook County Jail or when they're released from the Illinois Department of Corrections, and I talked to one who I witnessed a drug transaction yesterday, um, uh, they need to be uh, provided uh, interventions that will help them succeed. So this particular person I spoke to who I witnessed a drug transaction, I said, you know, I can get you a job. And he said, no, you can't. I have a felony history. And I said, oh, to get this job, you have to have a felony history. Um, and and I, I have a slip of paper uh, that I always carry with me to give to drug dealers and let them know that there are resources out there. But it shouldn't be an alderman doing that. It should be at the time they're leaving Cook County Jail that we are setting them up to succeed right now when we release someone from Cook County Jail and they have no place to live, no source of income, no family support system, we set them up to, to repeat this cycle of crime. And the people we're seeing going through this have gone through it to way too many times. And it's time for us to change this. And COVID-19 is a way for us to revisit this approach and come up with something that's really going to work. Great, thank you. Um, I have one more uh, question specifically for you, and I want to get it in before you need to depart. But before I uh, uh, ask this question of you, I'm getting lots of um, information about the fact that it's uh, Alderman uh, Vasquez's birthday today. So I wanted to make sure that uh, we all <laughs> uh, thanked him for uh, choosing to spend his birthday with, with us uh, over this lunch hour. And I'm recalling that I think we had this uh, event on your birthday once before. Oh, and oh, how about that? Oh, uh, come on. <laughs> Thank you. birthday. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I'm glad to be here with you all. Where else was I going to go, right? <laughs> but no. <laughs> I'm thankful to be able to work and be able to be in this position. And um, it may be the birthday, but it just makes it more real thinking about it. So I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, absolutely. So happy birthday to you. 
Uh, back to you, Alderman Kappelman, with this uh, question before you need to scoot. Um, a development themed one. How has COVID-19 had an impact on local real estate development projects? And can you give us an update on um, any major projects in Uptown? Um, well, what we're finding is areas where um, there is an extreme amount of gentrification, they are actually getting hurt more. Uh, Uptown is going through gentrification, but um, development is still able to occur. Um, and that's, that's the curse we experienced as, um, as we try to, to improve our area with infrastructure um, improvements. And we worked so hard on, on uh, addressing public safety to make this a place safe for everyone. Um, as we did that, this area became much, much more attractive. So uh, there is a huge, huge demand for apartments. And especially for people uh, who have high college debt, who have no access to cars or can't afford a car because they're paying eight, nine hundred dollars a month for their college debt, they're coming to Uptown. That's gentrifying the area. So we've become a, we've become a victim of our success. So developments are still happening. Uh, the 4601 North Broadway, uh, that we expect demolition to occur sometime this summer. Uh, the Darlington at 4700 North Racine, that's opening up uh, June. Flats project at 4740 North Winthrop, that's still going on pretty quickly. The Lorelei at 1039 West Lawrence is going through extensive rehab. Um, 4502 North Beacon is a condo development. It's our first condo development since I've been alderman. I've been alderman. No, it's our second one. Second one since 2011. Uh, the Clarendon Park Community Center. Um, uh, we have TIF funding that was approved yesterday and we are now putting bids out for phase one of uh, the construction that's going out. And then there's projects that not yet have been vetted uh, through the community that still have to be before we can go anywhere. And that's the 4511 North Clark, uh, 640 West Irving Park Road. That's the Immaculata High School redevelopment and also the 1359 West Wilson, that's where the happy wash is. So we're still getting development. Um, there, there's, it's gonna be slowing down in some areas. That's, that's just the way it's gonna be. And uh, real quickly, uh, the ubiquitous question that has to be asked at the state of Uptown. Uptown uh, Theater? Exactly. What, <laughs> can you share, uh, obviously there was a lot of funding lined up and we were all feeling especially um, excited about the prospect of that moving forward. What's, what's the latest? Well, thank you, Jackie, for asking that question. Um, um, I talked with Jerry Michelson. He's still on board. This is still going to happen. Um, the money's all in place. Uh, they started a not-for-profit piece uh, to, to raise additional funds. Um, he, he believes it's going to happen, and I will keep pounding him to make it happen. All right. Well, thank you for your, your uh, insights into all of those uh, matters. Um, and thank you for joining us with your uh, schedule today. So if, I, I think you need to um, leave us uh, shortly. So I do. But thank you, Jackie. And thank you, Uptown United. The, the work that you do, I mean, you make my job so much easier, really. You really do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Martin, I have a question for you. Uh, Chicago has been in a tight financial situation for many, many years. Uh, how will the COVID-19 crisis impact this year's budget and services? Uh, and if the economy seems to look like it's going to slow down, how might this impact the uh, city's budget and, um, and ultimately the neighborhood's um, budgets in the future? So it's going to have a, a profoundly disruptive impact. We're, we're still, of course, figuring out what that's going to look like because, like I imagine everybody else on this call, um, we're looking to see when we hit bottom and then how quickly we can bounce back. But earlier this week at a finance committee hearing, I understand that um, Jenny Bennett, who's our city's CFO, had mentioned that we might be uh, looking at a $500 million loss in revenue this year. Um, still early projections. 
um, next year. Uh, still too early to say. I understand that with Cranes last week, last Friday, um, that Mayor Lightfoot might have mentioned uh, a billion dollar budget gap is, is not out of the question. Um, as we've discussed on several occasions already on this call, a lot of um, clarity around that will be provided when we see what the federal government is able to do. Because what we've received thus far through the CARES Act are is money that generally can only be spent directly on COVID related relief efforts. So if it's something where we know we'll see a loss of revenue when it comes to the amusement tax, the restaurant tax, of course, um, what are some other ones? Hotel, sales, parking, the real estate transfer tax. In the aggregate, those are going to be huge. And so if we get flexibility from the federal government in order to take federal funds, excuse me, and then reinvest them back into those areas to plug some gaps, that's going to be huge for us. But we know it's going to be a real challenge, right? We're not going to get 100% of the funding that we need in order to stay afloat. So in the coming months, as we get greater clarity, I think you're going to see a lot more discussion and, and transparent discussion within our communities led by our offices and then our offices talking with the mayor's office around what can we do um, such that um, to the extent we'll need to come to taxpayers asking for a little bit more, that they feel like there is this shared sacrifice and that we're using their resources more efficiently. Great. Thank you. Switching gears to a little in a different, little different direction, um, it might seem kind of wacky that we're spending, uh, continuing to move forward with the CTA uh, Red Purple Modernization Project. Alderman Osterman, uh, the uh, two billion dollars that's being spent on this project um, is it still going to kick off this year? And and can you give us an update on the uh, CTA Red Purple Modernization Project, please? I can, and I'm glad that Jeff Wilson from the CTA is an attendee today because uh, we're going to hold his feet to the fire. Uh, he's actually a great employee of the CTA. and um, So let me say this. I think um, a little bit of the answer I want to piggyback on Matt Martin is that in the overcurrent, or the reality of the world we're living in today is that we don't, we're not going to go back to the things the way they were. I think we as a community are going to have to adjust, as a city have to adjust. And I think one of the things that I'm thinking about or just kind of thinking about is the way people are going to live is going to be a lot more reliant on their neighborhood. You know, in the past uh, six months ago, everyone can hop in an Uber and be anywhere they want to be within 15 minutes. Um, I think the reality, the way people are living today is you know, what's around the block, what's around the corner. And I think what that's going to do is, I think in Uptown and other places, it's going to focus on what are the businesses that can, can cater to the residents who live in that community. I think it's going to make um, the communities around the city of Chicago that much more important, making sure across the city that every neighborhood has what Uptown has and Andersonville and Edgewater has, I think is critical for the, 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 the health and the growth of our entire city. So that's something that we're looking at. I think infrastructure citywide is going to play a huge role. And I think for our neighborhood, it's going to play a huge role. Um, I think we have been very fortunate that the Wilson Avenue train station was done uh, prior to all of this. And I think that we are about to start construction on the um, red purple modernization, which is going to be a uh, more than 2 billion. It's a multi-billion dollar project that's going to create jobs in our neighborhood. Um, it's going to provide a better reliability, bigger stations with elevators, escalators. Um, so some of those amenities, I think one of the things about the train stations is the platforms are going to be larger. So I think that the, the way public transportation is going to be evolving post COVID is going to be, um, you know, longer trains, more room for us to spread out a little bit. And I think um, what that's going to do is kind of put us in a, in a good position. I think long term, North Broadway is where there's going to be redevelopment. I think we've seen some of that with the AN building with flats moving in. I think that's going to continue, but I think how that grows and what types of businesses, what types of housing, how all that lays out, I think um, is to be seen. I think we want to see quality, diverse development that has affordable units for for rental, um, I think is going to be part of how we do that. So I think 
I think our neighborhoods are very well positioned, and I think the pro that I think if anything, we may see you know an acceleration of the project, um, and, and that's something that we might see as well. So I think CTA once uh, we're ready to open things up again has an office near Foster and Broadway, where community residents can come out and see what's going on. But um, as we speak, there's a building at Bryn Mawr and Broadway and a Metro Toyota that's coming down. Um, there's a, a little building that's next to um, the Argyle station will come down shortly. And I think one of the other things tied to this um, is that we're hoping to get timeline theater into the building uh, near Argyle. So um, all this is going to move forward. Great. Thank you. That's uh, great positive news. Um, Alderman Vasquez, uh, knowing that uh, based on what we just heard that we are going to be spending a lot more time uh, locally and in our neighborhoods. Um, what efforts um, are you leading to ensure that our dense, diverse community has adequate, uh, safe, open space to be healthy, active, and connected to nature this summer? Yeah, I mean, that, that is also kind of similar to the other question I had, it is a challenge, right? It's, it's trying to make sure, it, it is such a careful balance to figure out how you open up a space while not promoting more congregation, right? And so that's what I've been looking at in the 40th board. One was Andersonville, as we mentioned before, but also Lincoln from almost what we know as Lincoln Square, which is part of Alderman's ward, um, Alderman Martin's ward. But from like Lawrence to Peterson, it's, it's, it's kind of a really big area that I don't believe before was getting a lot of traffic. So it's figuring out how can you either narrow down streets but really allow the space for people to walk. And I think, like I said, I would be completely honest, I've got a lot of concerns about any of that happening during the summer period. I think that, you know, we, we have started to flatten the curve, but we have not. And there's different marginalized communities that are being affected more than others. So that's the challenge. The summer is an opportunity for a lot of the businesses in the city to be able to raise revenue they would not do in the winter, right? But at the same time, it's also this time where people can come out, congregate, and because of the rapid spread, because we see that it mutates somewhat, that we're seeing kids that are um, getting diseases that are related to COVID or, or um, you know, symptoms. It, it's to be, to be honest, it's something that we're very conflicted about. And we make sure that when we're thinking through it, that we're talking to the Department of Transportation, that we're talking to DCASE, which is a special events department, as well as the chambers in the neighborhoods, because it is a very careful and delicate thing. Because for all we know, we could exacerbate a second spike or find ourselves in a position in the fall where we're still dealing with this hospital is still overwhelmed and then a flu hits at the same time. Um, so like I said, it's something that we talked through, but we wanna make sure that everyone gets involved so we do it in a safe manner. I think we'll get to that point. There has to be some sort of movement forward because Governments are dependent on the economy moving forward, as are people just trying to pay their rent. Um, it, it's working together with the different departments to figure it out. So there, there aren't any easy answers, but it's something we're looking at, knowing we want to move forward in a way that's safe for everybody. Yeah, and I, I think um, along those lines, so much of this is about uh, communication, and I, I want to applaud uh, Mayor Lightfoot for figuring out ways in which to through um, creative use of the internet and her memes and um, all the things that she's been doing. I, I think, you know, trying to figure out a way tastefully to have uh, some fun with this to get people's attention um, on the seriousness of this situation from a health and safety perspective. I think uh, the challenge will be going forward is um, uh, you all creating your memes to be able to um, help continue the uh, communications on how we can all uh, still get out and have fun and, and, and stay healthy. So, um, but that's been a great thing to see. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your response to that. Uh, I have a, another question here that um, also would involve um, Alderman Kappelman, but uh, we'll get uh, Alderman Martin's uh, thoughts on this as well. If this is a question from one of our participants, uh, what's being done to revitalize Clark Street? Uh, the participant says, I'd like to see it be more than a retail dead zone between Wrigleyville and Andersonville. 
Uh, can it be set up as its own block club, club area? Uh, what, uh, and I know Alderman Martin, you've been great about meeting with uh, Uptown United on this matter already, but um, we want, if you could share your thoughts on uh, revitalizing uh, that stretch of Clark Street. It's something that was very much on our radar right when we got into office and when it was one of the two or three corridors that we really wanted to prioritize. Before COVID hit, what our plan was, was working with Alderman Kappelman to prioritize a corridor study like we've seen in a few other places so that as we started to see that um, generational turnover occur and more development proposals come in that we had a framework within which to operate. Um, it's still something that we're discussing, although with COVID we want to make sure that anytime we're talking about um, potentially significant get use of public funds, that that's the highest and best use, but also that it's timed right. So we want to make sure that we're talking with the chambers and others to ensure that now is the appropriate time as opposed to a year from now, for example, when we have a better sense as to, um, for example, that first floor retail, because that's really important to maintaining that walkability. Who's well positioned to take advantage of that if we um, really want to uh, get prescriptive? So we've been talking with some of the anchor institutions as well, Black ensemble theater most notably to see how they're envisioning that um, corridor to grow because when you already have institutions like that you want to make sure that you're complementing um, the sort of foot traffic and customers that they're already bringing. Um, the last thing I'd say about that is um, as is the case with a lot of the corridors in the 47th ward I think it's a great opportunity to bring in density because it's great to bring in the sort of businesses that folks who want a patron, but we also want to make sure, especially as Alderman Osterman mentioned, that we're really thoughtful to who would be willing to walk or bike over to one of those places as opposed to relying on folks to take an Uber, public transit, or otherwise. So I think it's going to be critical that um, as we already have some larger buildings, some beautiful ones like the ISIL on, on the corner of Wilson and Clark, that we think about what sort of um, buildings, say three or four stories, that would fit within that context, but again, making sure that it's something that the residents and existing businesses are comfortable with. Right, thank you. Yeah, it is an area that um, I can speak to you personally since I live so close uh, to it that is um, in sore need of attention, but I know there's a lot to be reprioritized as we, as we go forward. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to find my question for you, Alderman Osterman, about the, um, heading back to the question we had earlier about the- uh, Accessory you, dwelling units? Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. You've got a lot to juggle in the <laughs> Zoom world. Questions, people raising their hand, Snapchatting yes. on there. Um, yeah, 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 so thank you. Based there's an ordinance that uh, myself and Alderman Martin have, are co-sponsoring um, that's been percolating for some time. And what it does is, in a streamlined fashion, allows uh, property owners to add units. Um, an example would be a two-flat or a three-flat in Andersonville or south of Foster, west of Broadway, um, where they could uh, the owner could add a unit in the basement. Um, it also allows for coach houses. Um, and I think we're kind of a dense neighborhood, so that's a little bit of a challenge, but there's other parts of the city where people might add a coach house. Um, for larger courtyard buildings, uh, there'd be affordability requirements. So, you know, think of courtyard buildings on maybe Kenmore and Winthrop that um, someone would want to add more than two um, units in the basement. Uh, those units, half of those would have to be affordable. So big picture citywide, we look at this as a way to add more units that I think by community will be affordable for that community. I think we look at it as a way to add housing. I think one of the challenges moving forward from um, the crisis that we're in is, is um, people I think are going to want to spread out a little bit. And I think uh, density is an issue. And I think people are going to want to look for smaller buildings. So um, a senior citizen who is in, a, in a, a large apartment building might feel more comfortable in a, in a garden unit. Um, a college student who's coming home who's not going to go live in the West Loop is going to maybe come home to the house and uh, have a unit in a coach house. Or, so um, big picture, again, we look at this as a way to add housing around the city in an affordable way. And uh, 
the other part of this is from a property tax perspective and an income revenue for landlords. And, and think of the, you know, the, the, the husband and wife or couple that owns um, um, a two flat and they want to add another unit to pay for rising property taxes, which unfortunately we have on the north side. Um, this would be a way where they could kind of maximize part of their building that's not otherwise being used. So we think that this is kind of a win-win. Um, we're going to spend some time over the next month and a half talking to uh, people around the city about this issue and, um, and, and answer a lot of questions, but I think it's something that we think is going to be beneficial for Chicago um, now and in the future. And Alderman okay. Martin can add on to that if he wants to, because he's been working with me on it. Okay. Alderman Martin, did you have any more to add to that? Yeah, uh, two quick things. One is, and this might be the case a little bit west of Uptown, but we've seen in areas like North Center and Lincoln Square, a lot of deconversions of two and three flats into single family homes. And along with that, retail corridors, particularly along Lincoln, struggling a little bit more as a result. So I want to underscore the fact that if you can bring in folks, especially maybe those college grads, as Alderman Ulsterman had mentioned, or those seniors with uh, hopefully a little bit of a disposable income, that's great in terms of bringing that additional foot traffic. And then one of the things that I'll be really sensitive to is making sure that we can share some guidelines for folks, especially um, who are of somewhat modest means, around what, um, what, what bringing online one of these ADUs will look like, because not everyone's going to be able to afford um, an expensive architect developer to come in to, to do this stuff. So we want to make sure that we're providing those resources. Say, oh, based on these specs, maybe converting this um, basement unit will cost eighty thousand dollars, or oh gosh, it's going to cost one hundred sixty thousand dollars. And as a result, they're going to want to take a look at their finances in different ways, whether it's loans or other things. So it's one of the things that we've seen with some other jurisdictions, especially on the West Coast, is that it might take a, a few years for us to really hit our stride in order to bring on um, the sort of units that we need right away. So maybe it'll be a, a little bit modest at the outset. We want to make sure that um, in the coming years that we're continuing to solicit that input so that five, seven years from now, it's, it's really, um, I think, growing like gangbusters like you've seen on the West Coast. Great, thank you. And uh, speaking of West Coast and um, creative ideas, um, I have a question here from one of our participants. Will there be opportunities to close streets to vehicle traffic to allow for more restaurants and bars to serve uptown while social distancing, even if it's in a kind of a temporary format? Um, Alderman Osterman, do you want to take that one to start? Yeah, I think all of us um, can chime in, but I think um, we want to try to create spaces for businesses to open up and open up uh, safely. And I think one of the things that each of the aldermen on the call working with Uptown United is to look at each business individually and find ways that they can do that safely. Um, streets like Broadway have big sidewalks and trying to look at a, you know, Tank Noodle is an example, trying to look at a place like Tank Noodle that can kind of spread out a outdoor seating area along Broadway. Are there places that are next to a parking lot that might be used um, as, as throwing some, putting some tables there? Are there parts of streets that we can close down? One of the challenges that has come with this idea though we have to consider is that in the, over the last 10 weeks, um, businesses that have stayed open, specifically restaurants, have really shifted to um, takeout. So their business model and survival right now is curbside pickup. So we have to be sensitive in how we do this to do it in a way that will not impact that part of their business that is keeping them afloat. So I think, um, I think it's going to be something that we're going to look at very intently over the next 10 days and beyond. It's still unclear yet from the city's perspective as to when that's going to be able to happen. But I think um, my perspective, and I'm sure my colleagues join me, is we're going to be very flexible, meaning that car traffic is down. Um, so taking parts of streets, shutting streets down, I think is something that we're going to be very open to. Um, 
to try it out and see how it goes. And I think um, the, the, the city's departments are going to be flexible with that as well. Yeah, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. And I think, I think we have to look at it two ways is, is one, what does an intermediate solution look like? Like in the immediate, how do we, how do we make these adjustments? But over the long term, I think we have to re-envision one, how we're, how we're building, how cities are, are set up and how we look at transportation. Because I think the one thing that kind of struck out to me uh, and is a conversation I had prior to COVID is what other countries have done as far as pedestrianization of streets. So in Barcelona, there are like these super blocks where they take like nine blocks in a square and kind of completely block the street that way. So I think, I think looking at over the long term, we could see some benefit as we change the way people use transportation over the long run, right? If people are using less vehicles, if our public transportation kind of makes the adjustments similar to what Alderman Osman mentioned as far as housing infrastructure changing to deal with homelessness. I think over the long term, there'll be a lot of potential benefits how we re-envision things, um, but we also have to think about what we're going to do in the immediate. And so that's that's a challenge. Just looking at one now, but not taking our, our, our eye off of where we could go with it. Right, thank one you. thing I'd add yeah, too, and this this has relevance not just for commercial corridors, but also um, residential streets, side streets, um, is the opportunity to do like a slow street or a shared street where it's closed down to through traffic. You're not taking away parking, um, but you are providing that opportunity for folks who maybe they don't have a backyard or a side yard or they just need a little bit more space, whether it's running, walking around, uh, teaching their kids how to ride a bike, just making sure that we're um, using those spaces uh, a little bit more thoughtfully because in, in the immediate term, folks are probably going to continue to feel how narrow those sidewalks are in ways that they didn't a few months ago. So th these are uh, policies that places like Oakland have adopted. So that's another thing that we're looking at, not just our commercial corridors, but also the residential streets as well. Great, thank you. I um, want to throw out a little bit of good news. I, I did hear from uh, Maria, the owner of Uptown Bikes, that um, she's never been busier. And I'm hearing that uh, it's pretty difficult to get your hands on a bike right now if you don't already own one, because people are uh, looking to that as a, as a way to get out and about. And uh, so kind of- Alderman Vasquez is gonna look for one for his birthday. So it's, uh, <laughs> we're gonna try to get him a bike uh, maybe for his birthday, all of them, Martin and I are going to chip in and, and try to find him one. Okay. So, Jackie, well, one thing if I could add in <laughs> related to the outdoor cafes, and I, I see one of the questions relates to the lakefront is this. Um, it's inherent on all of us to continue to do the things that we have to do health-wise, social distancing, wearing masks, um, all of those things that we hear from public health, from the CDC, that all makes a difference. And I think that everybody wants the lakefront open, everyone wants the outdoor cafes open and the restaurants open, but we all have a responsibility in that. And I think when I go outside and I see people walking around, um, typically people that are younger than I, without a care in the world, no masks on, um, that really gets me aggravated. And I think that it's important that um, everyone understands that we're still in the middle of a pandemic. and while we're talking about positive things we're looking forward to in the future, each of my colleagues every day gets a count on how things are going in their ward as it relates to health. And all of us know nurses and doctors and police officers and firemen that every day are helping um, save lives in our communities and across the city of Chicago. And I think um, people cannot lose sight of that. And I think it's critical that um, as we begin to reopen Chicago, our very dense, diverse city, that neighbors have a responsibility in making sure it's safe. And I think that if we can't do that, some of the things that we're going to try to open up um, are going to close back down or we're going to have more people that are sick. So I think that um, it's important that we don't lose sight of that. And I, I just think that that's something I wanted to, to share. Yeah, I, I have two points to add to that. I think the one thing that we've also been looking when we get briefed information is really how it's striking at the Latinx and African American community because the casualties and the cases are definitely much higher than the rest of the population. So it's thinking about the fact that I don't think it's a coincidence that a large majority of some of the essential workers that are out there happen to be from those communities. So we're seeing people that are out there exposed to the public getting sicker 
And that's something we have to take into consideration when we think about the lakefront, as well as what it would look like to even allow people in and the concerns for equity in that piece. So let's say you've got officers who are the ones making sure that people are abiding by code and who can come in and who can't. I think that if we don't think that through properly, could lead to other problems. And, and Lord knows we have meetings every month where we have to deal with settlements because of how some interactions go. So I think I understand the frustration. I think the lake is one of the most beautiful things our city has. I get why we all want to be there, but we have to make sure that we do it in a manner that keeps us all safe and then make sure that everyone from across the city has the same experience if we're going to move forward with it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to leave the, uh, we have a final question here, which both um, Alderman Osterman and uh, Vasquez have pretty much answered. I'm going to let uh, Alderman Martin kind of wrap us up here with the uh, three minutes we have left. Um, what can residents, businesses, and organizations do to support each other and our community right now? Great question. Um, so I think what, what folks can do to support re, uh, businesses is to shop local. Um, if you've got disposable income, um, really think twice before you hop on Amazon and purchase it and think instead, is there something, um, is, is that an item, is that a service that I can procure instead locally? Um, and even if it's something where you're thinking, hey, I need this right now, but it's going to have to wait a little while, like a haircut, uh, you can pay for that in advance because I think those little things in the aggregate are going to be hugely important for folks. Um, even as we hear decisions being made, like I think the county pretty soon is going to vote to defer property tax payments for two months, which is great. So I think generally we all need to look at similar things like that. Um, uh, so supporting those businesses has never been more important. I think we all know folks who uh, maybe are on the older side or have um, some pre-existing condition checking in to see, just wanted to see if you have everything you need, especially if it's a, a senior neighbor, seeing if they might need help uh, going to the grocery store to the extent you feel comfortable doing that. Um, just letting them know in this time where it's harder to be in person with folks, letting folks know that you care about them is really important. And then finally is, is letting um, our offices know how we can continue to be of assistance, what sort of questions people have, because um, that's what we're for. And in many ways, more than ever, we are that conduit of people asking us questions. We reach out to the various departments or to our colleagues at the federal level, like Congresswoman Schakowsky, to see, hey, what's going on? We're hearing about this issue. We're hearing about this question. We take that back to the community uh, and this person. So I think our, our role is really helpful there to be that collector and disseminator of information. So, so don't hesitate to reach out and uh, let us know how we can help. Yeah. Right, thank you. I have one thing to add to that is, is this is the time to reach out to your congressional leaders and not the ones that just agree with us, but the ones that don't, because when we're talking about the funding that we all need, that local governments need, when we're talking about how we're gonna address rent, homelessness, all these problems that you're seeing your city government do the best it can, right? Because it's, it's really a stopgap measure until we figure out what the federal government can do. This would also be the time to make sure that your voices are heard about what you expect to see. And as the Congresswoman said earlier, get out to vote, Make sure everyone you know gets out to vote because it needs to change at the top for us to be able to have more support. Yeah, thank you very much. We're out of time, unfortunately. I'm gonna uh, get to you, Martin, so you can take us out here. Uh, so to you, Martin. Great, and I'll be quick because uh, running out of time here. When I first of all thank um, all the aldermen for joining us. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to. Um, talk to our folks today and Congresswoman Schakowsky and the folks at her office for um, making the time to join us today. And then also a big thank you to you, Jackie, for moderating our chat today um, and for your leadership with our organization. So wonderful to see everyone and see everyone here joining us for the event. Um, if there's anything else that we can do for you here at Uptown United or the Chamber, um, feel free to get a, get a hold of us. Our physical office is still closed, but you can call or email anyone on our team if there's anything else we can do to help you. So Everyone stay safe and healthy, and we hope to see you all as soon as we can. Thanks. Thank you.